terms of lunar exploration, it's being driven a lot by China at the moment, and it's hugely exciting. So uh, a couple of years ago, China sent the first rover back to the moon since 1976 when we had those Soviet lunar rovers. This is U2, the Jade Rabbit uh, lunar rover, which sort of trundled off the spacecraft, explored close to the lander, returning data back to the Earth. Earlier on this year, the Chang'e 4 mission um, landed in the far side of South Pole Aitken Basin. And this is the first time we've ever sent a spacecraft landing successfully on the far side of the moon. And it, that spacecraft is still conducting science. It's sending data back to Earth. And just next week, my colleagues are going over to China to talk to Chinese scientists about working on uh, scientific collaboration using these data sets. But as we look forward, early next year, this is where the real fun starts, for me anyway, being a lunar sample person. We're going to get our first samples back from the moon um, since um, 1976, when the Chang'e 5 spacecraft will touch down on the near side of the moon and bring back about a kilogram of moon rock. And that's massively exciting because it gives us a new data set, a new data point in our understanding. And then after that, they're talking about doing sample return from one of the polar regions as well. So the space race, the geopolitics is sort of well and truly uh, driving a lot of this again, but us scientists are really benefiting. And we've got lots of new collaborations with Chinese colleagues in fact, we just had a Chinese student working with us in Manchester for six months, uh, preparing the way to collaborate on some of these sample initiatives. In addition to the Apollo samples, we also have moon rocks are free. And these are samples that we actually get delivered here to Earth. So an asteroid or a comet hits the moon, strikes a piece off, it flies through space, gets attracted by Earth's gravity, comes down as a shooting star or a fireball event, survives that horrible atmospheric entry event, and then we can go and find them. So we've currently got, we're heading upwards a little bit since these statistics, we've got about 300 or so individual stones of the moon which have come here as lunar meteorites. Again, we have a piece on our stand you can go and have a bit of a look at. But we can go and find these in places like hot deserts, such as the Sahara or Chile or Australia, or we can go down to Antarctica. And I'm going to do a talk tomorrow about meteorites hunting in Antarctica. The upshot of that story is I've never found a lunar meteorite in Antarctica. I found a lot of asteroid pieces, but I hold out hope that um, on the upcoming mission that we've got planned, we'll bring back a piece of the moon. But these, the great thing about these samples is we don't know exactly where they came from, but they provide us with pieces of the moon outside of the Apollo landing sites. So they're giving us a new insights to the global geological structure of the moon. Right, so we've got all this information. We've got our Apollo samples, our meteorites, our spacecraft data. How are we putting all this together? Why should we care about funding research, doing research into the moon, and what does it tell us about other processes? Well, fundamentally, although the moon is a geologically fascinating body, it tells us a huge amount about the Earth. So the moon and the Earth have had this shared origin. They've shared four and a half billion years of history in near space environments together. The Earth is an active geological body. It has water, it has oceans, it has active plate tectonics, which are recycled over and over again. And so a lot of Earth's early history, that early period, has been lost through this kind of active geological processing. Whereas the moon has just been sitting there, accumulating information, preserving this information of the Earth's own past. So it can tell us a lot about the Earth's own history as well. It provides us with this record of the inner solar system environment from billions of years ago. So it can tell us about dynamical processes, things flying around the solar system, and actually how planets form and geologically evolve as well. And it can provide us with evidence of how we got all that fabulous water out there in terms of how these volatiles were delivered to Earth. Were they all delivered at the start during the early processes of planet formation, or were they brought here later on as hydrated asteroids and comets slamming into the Earth and slamming into the moon, kind of delivering these materials? So the moon, the samples of the moon tell us that it has had a very similar uh, uh, geochemical similarities with the Earth itself. So we can analyze these rocks in our laboratories, and in terms of certain elements and certain uh, isotopes, they're identical, and in terms of some other elements, they are significantly different. And this tells us that the moon had this probable very, very violent origin in a giant impact event. And the high temperatures and high pressures associated with this event would have kind of uh, uh, vaporized a lot of the volatiles, a lot of the water, a lot of the moderately volatile elements that were then lost or reaccumulated by the Earth rather than going into the moon. After the moon formed as a hot kind of magmatic ball of a magma, um, it differentiated into a core, a mantle, and a crust. 
And we can track this and understand this in terms of how we can understand all the other formation of the rocky planets. So we call this a magma ocean phase of planetary evolution. And our ideas about magma ocean worlds, so the formations of magma oceans on all rocky planets, come from studying the Apollo samples. So what we think happened is after we had this magma ball, it slowly cooled, formed crystals that sank down towards the lunar interior. Other crystals then formed that floated up towards the surface, forming the moon's white crust. And this is why we have an anorthositic white crust on the moon. And the evidence for this crust formation process comes back from our Apollo samples. And this is the Apollo 15 Genesis sample collected by uh, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin um, at Apollo 15. And it, it represents some of the earliest phases of this magma ocean uh, petrogenesis. And there's a small piece of one of these samples again over in that moon disk that you can go and have a hold of. The moon's cratered surface tells us about impact bombardment processes. We can measure the size and relative scale of these impact craters to understand when they were formed on the moon and to understand how different types of objects were flying around the solar system early on in its evolution. So some of the big questions we have were, all, were all the impact craters made by comets? Were they made by asteroids? or what type, and have there been changes in impacting populations through time? And this has been an area of research that I've worked on quite a bit. So on the uh, right-hand side, um, on this sort of plot, we go from, if you read it this way, four and a half billion years ago, all the way through to the present day. Um, you can see there's a lot of wiggly lines, and that's because actually our understanding of the impact bombardment rates on the moon early on is really poor. What we know is that all the really big lunar basins, so the big things bigger than about 1,000 kilometers, were formed early on prior to about 3.8 billion years. What we don't know is if they all formed in a relatively small interval of about 20 million years or 200 million years. If they did, we would call this the late heavy bombardment or the lunar cataclysm. If they didn't, and they formed kind of earlier on than that, then we have to reinterpret some of our ideas that we have about impact bombardment rates. And we go to scientific meetings, and different groups stand up, and they yell at each other, and people keep changing their mind about all of this. But this is really significant, because if all the lunar basins were formed in quite a narrow period, this would also have happened on the Earth. And this could have a huge implication for when our continents first formed, when life first started here on Earth, and the, whether our crust was reprocessed in the same way that the moon's crust has been reprocessed. So pretty fundamental questions about the Earth and the moon system. Um, and the only way we're really going to test these questions is by going back to certain key basins and impact craters on the moon and filling in some of our knowledge of the ages of its surface. We can also revel in our new spacecraft data at how complex some of these impact craters are. So this is Tycho, which you can see really easily just with a pair of binoculars. It's a very, very young, fresh impact crater on the near side. He's tiny. He's only 85 kilometers in size, OK? So compared to some of the big basins. But we can now, with our high-resolution spacecraft, uh, look at these things to understand the impact cratering as a process and understand uh, how projectiles shape and resurface other worlds. And it's target sites such as this, this is the central peak of Tycho, that could be really good places to go and geologically sample in the future to access rocks that have been brought up by that impact collision during the impact events, providing us with samples of the subsurface environment. OK, so Moon tells us quite a lot about the Earth and how our own planet has been shaped thinking more widely about the rest of the solar system. In terms of a comparative planetology model, when we study rocks in the moon, when we study geological processes on the moon, we also have to think about them in relation to Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. So our sister terrestrial planets. So, and we can use uh, our understanding to sort of help interpret other worlds as well. So going back to impact craters for a moment, and, and this is the same sort of plot that I put on before, we can use our impact craters to do something really cool. If we know the place on the moon where we have a geological sample that we've age dated in our laboratory, and we know the numbers of impact craters that are formed in that geological unit, so we draw kind of a boundary around the geological unit, count the craters inside, we can actually start to calibrate the impact rate of the lunar surface. So our Apollo missions have helped us to sample really quite nicely different parts of the lunar impact cratering curve. So we have some craters that are pretty recent, so up to about 800 million years ago. And then we have our Apollo landing sites that tell us about the earlier period of lunar history. There's really poor sampling in the middle of this interval and in the early part of the solar system. 
But this is significant because if we can calibrate our impact cratering curve, then we can apply it to other planets. And this is exactly what we do. So we, first of all, we go to the moon, we map its geology, and this is a geological map of the lunar surface. I know it looks a little bit like a lot of fried eggs have been thrown at the moon, but all of these different geological units have been mapped out and they've been given an age so that we can interpret things in a geological order and we can give them geological units. But the really nice thing about the lunar cratering curve is that we can do this for other planets as well. And so we've rescaled, we've recalibrated this cratering curve to age date the surfaces of, this is the test to see if you can work out which planet's which. This is Mars, Venus, uh, at the top there we have Vesta, which is a huge asteroid in the asteroid belt, and then we have Ceres, which is the biggest asteroid in the asteroid belt. And we wouldn't know anything about the geological ages of any of these bodies, or you know, we wouldn't be able to say this volcano erupted 200 million years ago on the surface of Mars without the knowledge that we have from the Apollo samples calibrating our lunar impact cratering chronology. So it's absolutely critical. And if you think about those missing gaps, there's some really key times in terms of lunar history we've not yet sampled yet to really do a good job of this. In terms of could the moon preserve life? Okay, so this is quite a controversial thing. We know that the moon has no bugs. There's no life's ever been detected on the moon but it could be a really good analog for understanding the limits for life in the solar system. So typically we say where there's life is where there's water. And we do know that there is water at the lunar poles trapped really cold, down at about 40 Kelvin or so in some of these permanently shadow craters. Now, I'm not suggesting there is life existing in any of these craters, but there could be some really exciting prebiotic chemical processes. These ices are, uh, are kind of directly in contact with cosmic rays, with the solar wind, and there could be some really interesting environments that could be studied to sample uh, kind of how um, organic molecules form, how amino acids form, which could have some interesting astrobiological implications. And so what we'd really like to do is actually go to some of these polar craters, collect the ice cryogenically, return it to Earth to address some of these questions about uh, if the moon could be thought of as an analogue for uh, uh, how life could potentially survive elsewhere in the solar system other than the Earth. Okay, so in t in, uh, moving on from kind of the solar system, let's look out to astronomy. So the moon provides us, because it's very old, this four and a half billion year old history, it actually provides us with a history of our own sun and the galaxy that we've been occupying since it was first formed. We can also use the moon to compare to the exoplanetary systems that we're now detecting with our next generation of telescopes. And then thinking about what we could do on the moon, and this is really timely being here at Jodrell, we'd really like to do astronomy from the moon, moon in the future. So in terms of the moon as a special environment, the moon has no atmosphere. It has a very thin exosphere, so uh, hardly any gas there. And this is great because it means that its surface is constantly in contact with the solar wind that streams from the sun and from cosmic rays that are generated from um, uh, kind of uh, different star bursts out, out elsewhere in the galaxy. So the lunar regolith, the lunar soil, is a really special environment which has preserved this record. And some of the work that we've been doing in Manchester and working with colleagues down at Birkbeck College in London is to pick apart how the lunar soil could potentially track changes in solar activity or in galactic activity back through time. So the Earth-Moon system has moved around the arms of the galaxy about 20 times since uh, we formed four and a half billion years ago. And what we'd really like to investigate is if the Earth-Moon system passed close to, say, a supernova, or it passed close to some other kind of significant um, uh, cosmic ray generating uh, astronomical, astronomical phenomena, we hope to see geochemical signatures of that locked up in the moon's rocks. And so we're just embarking on this odyssey to see how the moon can be a proxy for ancient solar and galactic systems. In terms of what the moon can tell us about exoplanetary systems, well, as I mentioned, the moon is this marker of key solar system events. So um, on the left-hand side here, we can see uh, this is a protoplanetary disk um, which has been observed by the ALMA telescope down in Chile. You can see there a, a dusty disk of material that represents a very young star with dust accumulating around it, and the dark gaps that you can see represent where we think planets have been moving around this star system, gathering dust to form uh, planets early on. 
Well, our understanding of the planet formation process and then how these exoplanetary systems have changed through time, we can kind of use our understanding of our own system, solar system as an analog. And on the um, uh, right-hand side here, you, this is a kind of a, a schematic of through time up to the present day um, and the key things that were going on in our own solar system's history. So at the top there, we have the period of when planets were first forming. We have mixing in the disk as things were moving around, forming protoplanets, small planetary bodies. And then we have uh, mass removal where small planets were being thrown off out of our solar system early on. But this is this key bit in terms of our, our solar system's evolution. So about 800 million years after solar system first formed, 3.8 billion years ago, We've always believed, uh, well, since the Apollo samples were first studied, that there was this late heavy bombardment. And people have used this to try and understand why this could occur. So why were asteroids and comets slamming into the moon and the Earth, creating all these big basins? And it's been suggested that actually it could be to do with the outer solar system. So the orbital migration of Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, and perhaps even Neptune and Uranus swapped around in their orbits, throwing material, disrupting the asteroid belt, disrupting the outer solar system Kuiper belt, throwing material into the inner solar system. So if this kind of late heavy bombardment period, if this giant orbital migration occurred, that has implications for understanding uh, similar processes in other exoplanetary systems as well. Um, however, I should caveat this by saying, if the late heavy bombardment didn't occur, then that tells us something different must have caused uh, whatever, what was sort of uh, causing our giant planets to migrate around. And that's something we really need to tie down to be able to compare to exoplanetary systems. So I mentioned radio astronomy from the moon. So radio astronomy from the moon, if I can go back, there we go. Um, this is a potentially a really good thing we could be doing. So the far side of the moon is radio quiet. Um, there is no noise or interference there from uh, radio emissions being made here on Earth. And so people have suggested actually it's the best place in the solar system to be doing deep radio astronomy, the types of science that we do here at Georgia Bank. So who knows, maybe Blue Dot 2030 could be on the moon. Maybe we could have a new um, station up there doing radio astronomy. The Chang'e uh, 4 rover mission, uh, which is currently on the lunar surface, does have a test radio astronomy experiment right now. And the idea is if that works, then eventually, hopefully, we could scale something up. Uh, this would be a, enabled by a, a human architecture to get human beings back to the lunar surface uh, in placing some of these complex geological, uh, astronomical um, observatories. So, back to the moon. What are we doing? Well, this is one of the Chinese rovers. Uh, this is uh, ongoing as a new phase of lunar exploration. Why we should go back to the moon? Well, I think we should go back to do cool science, right? So if we're going to go back for geopolitics, every time we do this, we should think about getting some uh, science, uh, scientific experiments um, on the landers. We should plan ahead for the best places to go and do geological sampling through sample return initiatives to address all of these questions and to work out how the moon is a cornerstone of Earth and other planetary uh, so questions that we have. So understanding our own origins, understanding the evolution of the solar system. We should go back to the moon for exploration's sake as well. So NASA have just announced in 2024 they're going to send crew back to the moon um, through the Artemis program. So we might actually get a woman walking around on the lunar surface conducting science. But this is a stage return to the moon where the grand plan is to eventually put a, a lunar base there to do in situ resource utilization. So the next phase of lunar exploration is going to be understand what resources are there, so be it volatiles, ices, water how they're bound up within the lunar soils, and then develop technologies for accessing uh, these volatile rich materials so that we can extract things like water and oxygen from them to turn them into useful things. And then eventually use these resources to get us to other planets. And this is an example. Uh, my colleague Sim Barber is going to talk about this this afternoon at 2 o'clock in the Star Pavilion, so I'm not going to go into it in any particular detail. But in the UK, we are uh, collaboratively building um, a, an experiment called PROSPECT, which is a European Space ex uh, Agency experiment, which is flying to the moon with an Italian drill system to drill into an icy crater at the moon's south pole to sample its ices and to test if we can actually extract usable material out of this for use uh, in resource utilization. And then uh, Libby Jackson is going to be talking back here in this um, stage at 1 o'clock about the UK going to the moon. So you'll learn all about the UK Space Agency's um, efforts to get us back to the moon through these different spacecraft uh, and different landers. So although Prospect is a robotic lander, in terms of crew, we have a lot to look forward to. So NASA say they want to go back to the moon in 2024. Um, 
they probably, um, I'm confident that they will send uh, a, a lander, a, an orbiter around the moon by then. Um, and the really good news is for uh, Europe and the UK is that the service module part of the Orion um, uh, human crew vehicle is actually going to be provided by the European Space Agency. So ESA will be collaborating with NASA on the return to the moon, along with uh, our colleagues at the Japanese Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, and uh, Russian Space Agency as well. So as this puts forward, we can look forward to the next phase of lunar exploration being linked with the development of the Lunar Gateway, which is our staging post, which will hopefully be built in orbit around the moon, where we'll send crew to. And if we have this in orbit, this provides us and facilitates us access to surface. So either through robotic landers, bringing samples back up to then come back to Earth, and eventually sending crew down to the surface. So if you'd like to know a little bit more um, about our future plans for sending human beings back to the moon, uh, the European Space Agency has a fantastic interactive guide. You can go and watch the little videos, and you can learn a lot more about our future plans for getting back to the moon's surface. So I think on that note, um, I will leave it there. And hopefully, I convince you that it's worthwhile we go to the moon, we study its surface, we send our scientific experiments, and we use it to understand our own origins of the Earth, other solar system bodies, and, and our wider solar and galactic history as well. And just before um, I take a few questions, I'm going to leave you with uh, um, a little video, um, which is being developed by uh, NASA from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft. And what it shows you is, is a simulation of what Armstrong saw out of his window as he was landing the Apollo 11 uh, lander onto the lunar surface. So there was no video on board the lander. All we have is a little bit of a grainy, sorry, a little bit of a grainy uh, video. And we, have, uh, we can hear the astronauts talking about the trajectories of their landing craft. So what the guys from LROC have done is they've taken one of these high resolution um, uh, images of the Apollo 11 landing site. And then what you're going to see is the window projection of what Armstrong saw. And they've reconstructed all the different parts of the spacecraft uh, motion and movement. Uh, and then you'll see exactly what he saw. So hopefully, if this is going to go, after giving you a little bit of text, um, we'll get going. It's pretty scary how little they could actually see of the moon. This is my one take home message. So here we go. We can see Armstrong and Aldrin. This is Armstrong's view. You can see the large crater that they were supposed to land next to, which is actually covered with boulders. These things are like 50 to a couple of meters in size, proved to be too dangerous a landing uh, site. And this is where Armstrong started to kind of readjust the landing on the spacecraft to fly over the crater. He took manual control away from the computer and then landed it on the other side of the crater. So you can see enormous uh, boulders. And then things get a little bit fuzzy towards the end because the uh, LROC image spatial resolution kind of starts to disappear. But you can then kind of see them eyeing up the better place to land. And with this as their view, this is all he had to go on. And you can go on YouTube and you can also watch what Aldrin saw as well out the other window. It's pretty cool. I think they've picked a good spot now. So this is where they were building up to only having about 20 seconds of fuel left at the end of the landing, where mission control was starting to get a little bit panicky that he was going to effectively do it. Hovering around and then picking the right spot to come into land. This is all quite gentle towards the end. So these impact craters are probably about two to three meters in size. So still bad. And then you can see this is actually where the lunar lander is on the old rock image. And hopefully we're going to land on top to show you that they got the simulations correct. And you can see the shadow of the lander as well. There okay, thank goodness, it's a pinpoint precision landing. And then you can see, well, then the dust gets flown up as the uh, rocket jets kick up the surface of the lunar regolith. 
and we're down. And with that, I will leave it, and I think we have time for a couple of questions if anybody would like to ask me anything about the moon's geology. Thank you. Okay. okay, thanks very much, Katie. Uh, does anyone have a question? Yes, one over here. Hey, so I loved your talk, but um, you mentioned that the near and far side of the moon are wildly different, but we don't definitively know why. What kind of theories have we got as to why they're so different? Uh, yeah, that's the million dollar question. So, uh, <laughs> different people think different things. So we don't know if the face of the moon that we see from the Earth has always been locked towards the Earth. That's the first starting point. So some people have suggested that the near side of the moon has a much thinner crust because it formed closer to the Earth and it was a lot hotter, and so materials kind of moved around to the back side of the moon. That's one explanation. But we don't know if the face of the moon, which is now facing us, has always been the face that's been locked to us. So that one's a little bit arm wavy. The other thing is, is there's, um, if I can go back, let me see if I can get back to the image of the topography map. Um, there's been a suggestion that um, the near side of the moon has actually been resurfaced by a giant impact event that we call the Prosolarum um, impact event. Oh, that's not, no longer on the screen, but anyway, there's, there's a really big round looking ob thing on the near side of the moon. So maybe the near side was excavated into by a giant asteroid. It removed an awful lot of material. And then that's where we kind of have a lot of our heat, produ heat producing elements that are kind of concentrated. People have suggested that maybe the far side of the moon, the crust is too thick to allow the lavas to actually come through and erupt on top of the surface, which is why we have no maria there. We really don't know. I think, for me, the only way we're going to really test that effectively is by getting samples back from the far side highlands of the moon, because we can actually then geochemically match them to those we have from the near side and to measure the similarities and differences between them. So their age, their isotopic chemistry, um, and their chemical elements that are bound up within them. And from that, we can kind of start to test some of these hypotheses. Until then, that's the beauty of lunar science. I can throw my hands up and go, we need more samples to address that question. Hi, thanks. Great talk. What is the current state of thinking on the role of the moon shaping the surface of the Earth compared to, say, Venus, which has no moon? Yeah, so without the moon, um, it's been suggested that we, as people, wouldn't be here. So the moon helps to, we as people, we as life wouldn't be here. So the moon helps to stabilize the Earth's orbit. So we have an, uh, uh, we're slightly tilted on our orbit. This is called obliquity, and we, we wobble backwards and forwards. And yet the moon kind of maintains this in a relatively lim limited wobble. Mars has a massive wobble. So it goes back and forth. It kind of processes over um, millions and millions of years. And so it's been suggested that a lot of the climatic um, kind of drama on Mars it is because of this big wobble effect, whereas the moon sort of balanced us, so we don't have these big climatic swings through um, the period of uh, wobble, if you like, so that's one good reason. Other people have suggested that when the moon was closer to the Earth, early on in its evolution, um, the tidal ranges of our oceans would have been a lot bigger. And some people have suggested that these tidal ranges, uh, so the kind of shallows of the seas um, you know, going up and down uh, through um, through different uh, tidal cycles, could be really good environments where life started. And they provide us with the energy exchange we needed to start life. And so maybe some of these really big tidal pool regimes 3.8, 4 billion years ago, maybe slightly earlier, could have been places where life could have evolved, again, thanks to the fact that we have a big moon. The moon's also taken the hit from many of the big asteroids that were flying around the early solar system, so many of the big impact craters that you see on the moon were hit there rather than the Earth. But the Earth itself was pummeled. So because of the gravitational uh, pull of the Earth, we think that actually Earth's impact rate was about 17 times what the moon would have been. So although they don't preserve the scars of those really big impact collisional basins because of this geological recycling, uh, the Earth would have been absolutely whacked as well. And this is why it's so critical to understand if there was this disruption, this lunar cataclysm, this late heavy bombardment, or if things were a little bit more gentle, where there was just a series of big spikes every now and again. And that's why we really can only do that by going back and sampling lunar rocks from that early interval of the moon's history. Where okay. am I looking now? Uh, oh yeah, I think that's, uh, that's that all we have time for. We've yeah. got all the time. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I've talked too much. In that case, go see and hold the moon, get a photo of you with some Apollo samples because they don't come out very often, and um, enjoy the rest of the day and celebrations. Thank you.